Welcome back to my series on malicious shellcode analysis. Last time, we used a debugger to manually deobfuscate and dump shellcode. Today, in part two, I'll show you a faster, more efficient way to tackle this process with an open source automated unpacker that's also customizable. Let's dive in. So today I'm gonna to demonstrate an automated method for extracting shellcode from multi-stage malware. And it's going to involve introducing and focusing on a tool. Now, generally on this channel, I don't like to focus on tools, but if you're trying to unpack malware, you're short on time, and you're not too concerned with how the next stage is deobfuscated, well, having a reliable and versatile unpacker is helpful. The capability I wanna to discuss today was created by Alexandra, also known as Hasher Zeta. If you're watching this video, you've probably heard of her, read her excellent technical blogs, or used some of her tools like PE Bear, which I have installed here on my VM. You can go to her GitHub repo to explore the many projects she develops and supports, but the one I wanna focus on today is called Mal Unpack. Mal Unpack, as the name suggests, was created to unpack malware. And it does this by executing a sample and then passively scanning memory for new executable code. And by the way, it does this without relying on API hooking, which means it doesn't depend on exactly how the code is deobfuscated and it's resilient to common anti-analysis techniques. To demonstrate malunpack, I'm going to begin by running it against a different malware sample than the one we analyzed in part one of this series. You'll see why here shortly. So here on my desktop, I have syswow.exe, uh, which is the executable I introduced in part one of this series. I also have a 32-bit malware sample called mount.exe. Now, similar to syswow.exe, if I loaded mount.exe in a debugger, set a breakpoint on virtual alloc, and examined the allocated memory, we'd eventually find shellcode. But rather than manually performing those steps this time, I'll use malunpack to automate this. I've already downloaded malunpack from GitHub and added it to my path. So I'll now open up a command prompt, specifically an admin command prompt. And I'll go ahead and type mal underscore unpack so that you can see some of the command line options available to us as we begin to learn about this tool. The two key arguments here are slash exe, where you specify the executable to analyze, and you also have slash timeout, which sets how long malunpack will run in milliseconds before stopping. I won't cover all of the command line options here for this demo, but I'll mention that if you're unpacking a DLL that needs to be run via run DLL 32, you would specify using the slash exe option, the path to run DLL 32.exe, and then you would use the slash cmd option to specify the full path to the DLL along with the entry point. Now to go ahead and kick off malunpack, let me go ahead and first uh, clear my screen here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and type mal underscore unpack followed by slash exe, then mount.exe, which is gonna be the target of this particular analysis. I then have to include a timeout. This is gonna be 10 seconds in milliseconds. And now I'm gonna hit enter to go ahead and actually launch malunpack so that it can observe the execution of mount.exe and try to identify any additional stages of executable content. After it runs, the output shows that malunpack has found something suspicious and also that it's unpacked some content worth taking a closer look at. Now, in order to actually identify any dumped content down to disk, we're gonna go look for the mount.exe.out file within our current directory, which of course is the desktop. Now here, if I look on the bottom left, I will in fact see a folder called mount.exe.out. So I'll go ahead and just bring that more to the center of the screen here. I'll double click on it to dive into this folder and I'll keep traversing the folders that are contained within it. And we now see a variety of file types within this final folder. We won't view and discuss each file in detail, but I'll summarize them by saying that these JSON files contain details on what mal unpacked, scanned, and detected. The uh, text files, like the ones you see right here, contain information about any imports it identified in memory. And then finally, we have two .exes, which are executables it identified in memory, as well as a .shc file, which represents shellcode that it dumped down to disk as well. This indicates multiple stages of execution involving both shellcode and executables. We're gonna focus on the shc or shellcode file for now. And to confirm it contains shellcode, we'll load it into Binary Ninja's free version. If you're not familiar with Binary Ninja, check out the link in the description for one of my earlier videos, which introduces the free version. I'll go ahead and drag and drop the SHC file now to Binary Ninja Free, which I have here on my desktop. 
I'll click start to go ahead and launch the free version. Now I have to choose the appropriate platform. It is x86, but it is a Windows executable specifically, which means if I go to this platform pulldown, I can be a bit more specific and highlight Windows dash x86. I'll then click open here on the bottom right. And that'll start the process of actually loading this shellcode into Binary Ninja. To actually take a look at the code, I'll click on this second pull down here and choose linear. And here I have by default the high level IL representation of what I think is shellcode. So just to take a quick look at this code, I can see at the top here that there is a function named uh, sub underscore 467 that is called over and over again. But in each case it's called, the argument passed is a different hexadecimal value, which is interesting. If I go ahead and double click on this function right here to dive into it, you can start to see references to the process environment block or PEB. And uh, Binary Ninja has done a nice job of filling in a lot of the structures and additional members associated with uh, the process environment block in memory. So uh, that's quite nice and serves as a pretty good starting point for our analysis. Now that's all I'll say for now about this code, but the key is that malunpack successfully automated the extraction process by executing mount.exe, identifying new stages of execution, dumping those to disk, and then terminating the sample. By the way, if you're finding this video helpful, go ahead and hit that like button. It not only lets me know that you're enjoying the content, but it also helps other people find this video too. Now let's go ahead and run malunpack against syswow.exe. So I'll go ahead and type mal unpack here, followed by slash exe, specify syswild.exe. Then we need that timeout. We'll use 10 seconds again, and then I'll hit enter. Unfortunately, this time malunpack does not identify any suspicious code in memory, and it eventually times out after trying for 10 seconds. As I was considering if there was anything additional I could do to successfully and automatically identify the deobfuscated code in memory, I noticed that on the releases page for malunpack, the most recent version added a slash pattern option. To see what this was about, I'm gonna go ahead back to my terminal here and type mal unpack followed by pattern. We can see that the slash pattern option allows us to specify additional shellcode patterns for malunpack to search for, which means we can likely extend the tool's ability to identify and dump code. To test this, let's try adding a custom shellcode pattern to automatically detect and dump our shellcode. First, we're gonna need to open the shellcode that we extracted as part of our analysis in part one. And I have that syswow shellcode right here. Let me go ahead and drag that to binary ninja. Again, I'll have to choose the appropriate platform here. syswow.exe is a Windows 64-bit executable, so the shellcode is also likely gonna be Windows x86-64 here. And I'll go ahead and press open. And as always, I'll maximize my screen here. The second pull down, I'll go to linear to start taking a look at the code. And there, this code should be fairly familiar based on the analysis we did in part one. Now, let me transition to the disassembly here. And I wanna go ahead and select a few bytes to create a signature. For example, let's go ahead and choose these first two instructions here. And let's copy the hexadecimal bytes. So I'm gonna go ahead and right click and choose copy as followed by raw hex. If I then open up Notepad++ and just paste those values in, we have the actual opcodes associated with those assembly instructions. And in fact, if I go back to syswow here in Binary Ninja, right here, you can see those same exact opcodes here, the FC4883, E4, F0. But how do we know if these bytes are unique enough to work as a signature? Well, I'll usually start with a quick Google search to do some research. I'll go to my browser now, and I'm going to go ahead and paste those bytes here. Now, typically when I'm searching for bytes in a search engine, I'm gonna go ahead and put them between quotes here because I want those specific bytes to be looked for. And I'll also put a space between each of these bytes because I found that if these bytes are mentioned in a blog post or a script or a YAR rule, they are often in this format. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. And scanning through the results, I notice several references to Cobalt Strike and malicious shellcode in general. So even without diving into each of these links, this tells me that these bytes could serve as a solid, recognizable signature. Now that we have our bytes, we need to format them for malunpack. If I go ahead and return here to my command prompt, notice that it says that the file that specifies the shellcode pattern has to be in the SIG format. Well. Not knowing what the SIG format looked like initially, I came upon another of Alexander's projects called SIG Finder. 
There, I found information about the SIG format and an example. The SIG format includes a signature name, the number of bytes, and the hex sequence, where wildcards can be added if needed. So let's go ahead and update our text file so that it is in the appropriate SIG format. Uh, we'll name this signature bad underscore shellcode. Uh, these are five bytes. And then here we have these specific bytes. We'll go ahead and put a space in between them as they were in the example that we saw online. And then I'll go ahead and save this to my desktop and just call this uh, bad underscore shellcode dot sig. And then I'll save this. Now we'll return to the command prompt where I'll take advantage of this new signature we created. I'll type mal unpack, followed by, as we did before, slash exe, syswild.exe. We'll use that same 10 second timeout, but this time I'm going to add the slash pattern option and specify our new file here. And then I'll hit enter. And this time it's clear that mal unpack did find something suspicious and it unpacked something to disk. Now, in order to see what files it actually dumped down to disk, let me go ahead and go into this syswow.exe.out folder that it's created on my desktop. I'll dig into the subdirectories. And here I do now see a file ending in shc indicating some potential shellcode. The question is, does this match the same shellcode that we extracted manually in a debugger in part one of this series on shellcode analysis? Well, let me go ahead and bring up here in Binary Ninja that previously extracted shellcode. What I'm gonna do now is drag and drop this new SHC file into Binary Ninja. It's going to ask me again for the platform, which is Windows x86-64. I'll then hit open. It's now opened that shellcode. Let me go ahead to the disassembly view. And if I compare this new SHC file with the file that I previously extracted manually, you'll see that visually they are basically identical, right? If I go ahead and just uh, scroll up here a little bit, it becomes easier to identify that they appear to be identical. And in fact, if you were to do a more thorough comparison of the bytes in this shellcode, they are in fact the same. This means we've successfully extended malunpack to automatically detect and dump deobfuscated shellcode using a custom SIG file. And by the way, I did submit an issue on the malunpack GitHub repo to suggest adding these specific bytes to the built-in signatures. But honestly, I'm glad they weren't there because it provided a great opportunity to demonstrate how to extend malunpack with the new slash pattern option. Well, that wraps up this video on automating shellcode extraction with malunpack. We covered both the basics and using custom patterns to identify shellcode in memory. In the next video, we'll begin exploring strategies for actually analyzing the extracted shellcode. So be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time.